So um, thank you very much, Professor Daniela Sellermeyer for, uh, from Sydney uh, to uh, agree to participate in this project of multi-species art. Uh, uh, Daniela and I met in 2019 at a conference she had invited me to on multi-species justice. And also I had a glimpse into her multi-species life where she invited me to her farm. So it's such a pleasure to speak to you and thank you very much for joining me. Uh, Daniela's, uh, uh, you know, she's a sociologist and uh, lead of the multi-species project. I think one of the largest projects of its kind anywhere, academic project, multidisciplinary project. Uh, and uh, she has written uh, many, many books, in including deeply examine the ideas of torture, of uh, human rights, of justice, uh, including in South Asia. Uh, and is now uh, also uh, has done a novel with Penguin called Summertime. Mm. So that's a very sort of versatile and uh, uh, I think it reflects very much your, mm, your deep involvement in the questions you ask. But um, uh, let me just start with asking you and what I propose is that I ask you two or three questions and then uh, if you want to respond to any of the photographs, anything, say anything to say, then we have a freewheeling conversation. The idea is to just to uh, speak to an audience which is not academic, comes from many disciplines, and to see how should we think of this idea of the multi-species world. And uh, so just starting with that, you know, we have so many things called animal rights and, you know, uh, all these other rights we've bestowed on um, uh, on to a justice system. So, what what is what is different we are doing when we are using the word multi species justice, mm. a multi species world? Mm. Um, it's a it's a very good question, and um, it's also I want to say what a pleasure it is to be in conversation with you. One of the um, great aspirations that I have for this field of multi species justice is that. It's not only multi-species, but it's multimodal, so that we are speaking not only across disciplines but across sectors, uh, and that to some extent uh, fits in with the question that you've just asked me. So, animal rights discourses and attempts to enshrine animal rights or environmental rights in law have been important, pragmatically important. You know, of course, they haven't gone far enough. But the, the notion of rights is uh, it's a conception or an institution of justice that was designed with human beings in mind and also with a very particular conception of human beings in mind, the human individual, the, the, the kind of post-enlightenment individual who had claims against the state. And uh, multi-species justice is a more radical idea, not just that we assimilate beings other than humans into the ideas or institutions of justice that we already have, but we ask what happens to the idea of justice and to the practice of justice when beings other than humans are also included as the types of beings who are recognised as having ethical claims. Um, so it's, a, it, it, it's trying to decenter the human, not just expand those who come into a set of human concepts and institutions. So that's one sense in which it's different. And the other is that to date, and this is really the reason that uh, I was inspired to form this multi-species justice project, is that uh, environmental rights, animal rights and human rights have operated as siloed enterprises. And they occasionally come into contact. Uh, for example, if there's uh, an environmental poisoning from a factory farm, we might start talking about the impacts on animals, the impacts on humans and the impacts on the environment. But they're still generally thought of as three spheres uh, and there are different people who talk about them, different organisations who deal with them. 
Uh, but here we are, all of us, earth beings, all of us uh, inhabiting, uh, all of us facing what the climate catastrophe means together. And so the, the aspiration of multi-species justice is to think and transform together in light of both of the facts that we are all here um, impacted differentially because of differential power relationships and different levels of protection, uh, but also in many ways impacted by similar problems, particularly around environmental degradation and climate change. And even more radically, you know, as people are, you know, really in the last 30, 40 years starting to see whether it's in the discipline of physics or biology in the work of someone like Lynn Margolis or in philosophy in the work of eco-feminists and people like Donna Haraway or Karen Barad, Val Plumwood, this idea that actually to think of us as separate is a misunderstanding of the nature of being itself. Now, of course, that's an idea that is very old in many spiritual traditions, this notion that we are embedded in networks of other beings, that we are entangled in the language of physics. Um, but now, you, you know, it's being discovered in the knowledge of Western science, in biology, as I said, in physics. And so when you uh, blow apart two myths, the myth of human exceptionalism and the myth of the individual, you start to think of um, philosophically the way that our lives are interdependent and we co-arise, we emerge together, but also in more pragmatic terms uh, that with, without flourishing environments, without, you know, animals living lives which are, for example, not under conditions of um, massive antibiotic use in factory farming, human beings also can't flourish. So we rise or we fall, ultimately we rise or we fall together. Uh, so those are some of the differences of the notion of multi, of, uh, uh, that's where I think multi-species thinking needs to take us. And even the word multi-species is problematic because it still assumes that there are these separate species that we're bringing together. We need a more radical shift. That's, that's quite a wide sort of sh a sweep of things. We are talking of foundational and fundamental things here. Uh, I was thinking that uh, we still haven't tackled the issue of equity and human justice. You, you have done a lot of work on that, uh, on how we uh, uh, treat other human beings, the, the, the power positions we have, the inequities, the violence, which goes on even as we speak, both uh, in a very obvious way, but also in a very subtle way, for example, at home. Uh, so we haven't really treated, we don't treat human beings as equal. Uh, so then we expand it to multi-species. Isn't that too much of a jump? Isn't, should not this be a progressive idea that what is the urgency and how do we, can we think of these things together? Is that a shift which you're suggesting, which encompasses both mm -hmm. the world in which we live, which is outside the human, but also the human world, which is, seems to be unresolved. Mm -hmm. So again, this is, um, this is something that I have learned from my, eco-feminist mothers and grandmothers, people like Vandana Shiva, that uh, many of the forms of injustice and the legitimation for injustice amongst human beings, whether that be um, gender injustice or racial injustice, uh, the way in which that is justified uh, correlates in many ways with the distinction between humans and others. So those people who are uh, systematically marginalised or whose dignity or whose claim to decent life uh, is not taken seriously are the ones who are seen as more animal and less human. 
you know, either because women are closer to animals, because women are more body than mind, people of colour are closer to animals, again, they're more body than mind. So these these ways of dividing up the world um, that, you know, that some beings have agency, those beings who are more of the earth or of the body are of lesser value, that both organises forms of injustice amongst humans and injustice between humans and beings other than humans. So when you look at the logic that legitimates injustice amongst humans, rather than saying, okay, let's deal with the injustice amongst humans first, let's get that one right, and then we can turn to animals. I would say that it's actually the logics, the logics that drive the two forms or the multiple forms of injustice uh, have a very similar structure. So if you work on the structure of the injustice rather than the instances of the injustice, then you can see that these sets of problems actually come together. Um, so that's my that's my kind of conceptual answer. Although I don't, it's not just conceptual; it's about you know looking around the forms of injustice in the world. But my other answer is the the question is a supremacist question. The question which says let's deal with humans first. And my answer is why would we deal with humans first? Of course, I care profoundly about the suffering of human beings and the suffering human beings inflict on other human beings. But the assumption that the suffering of human beings is a graver form of suffering than that of beings other than humans, I think that needs to be called into question. And, you know, that, that can feel profoundly insulting to people. And I don't, you know, it is, this is not about... Um, not taking seriously the forms of violence that many human beings continue to suffer. It's just questioning the assumption that human beings are on the top of a hierarchy and we have some special claims that other beings don't have um, because we have, uh, we have adorned ourselves with capacities or we have named capacities that we assume we only have. Um, and then we, we universalise or we naturalise those hierarchies, you know, and really this is, these are inheritances of our theological systems, our philosophical systems, uh, and all forms, really all radical politics is about asking for the justification of those naturalised forms of hierarchy. Unfortunately, uh, in the case of beings other than humans, they don't make claims in the languages or in the forms that marginalised humans make claims. So whether it's um, women or people of a particular race or sexuality or people who have been marginalised on the basis of caste or ability, they have been able to make claims within the this kind of claims making language that we have, which is something like, I'm a human too. Um, now, animals or trees or forests or rivers don't make claims in that language. But of course, they're protesting very loudly. Um, you know, and you know this very well, you're, you know, as an artist, you're incredibly sensitive to the forms of protest that beings other than humans are making uh, in their own way of saying this treatment is contrary to the aspirations that we have for our own lives. Uh, it's, it's, it's our insistence that those claims don't count that has them, again, be placed at the bottom of the pile. And I, and I think it's incumbent on us to, to question that hierarchy on what is it based. So how do we create the space for that questioning? Because we are constituted in a certain way. We have these rights-based justice systems where all of us have rights and uh, we have as human beings agency and now we're talking of beings which cannot speak to us and, uh, and the systems at best accommodate them. They don't see us as being part of something else. It's a far cry from 
uh, for example, uh, when I see old uh, Tamil poetry, which I worked with, uh, with the fishers in South India, of how that poetry describes a very neutral landscape of coexistence, of, uh, of, uh, of the mm -hmm. backdrop of nature being the backdrop of human life. And today, we cannot think of nature as a backdrop. It's something which uh, we live in, but we are mm -hmm. sort of responsible for. We, we have no mechanism mm -hmm. to hear it, except in very, very um, extraordinary ways. But most people mm -hmm. don't hear what mm -hmm. it is. We cut down trees, we kill animals mm -hmm. for food, for industrial food without thinking. We, we have... Uh, we don't even think of cruelty to other beings when mm. we raise the issue of cruelty. Our mm -hmm. whole system uh, is of denial. Our whole constitution, const uh, we are constituted, constituted ourselves as selves which deny and give us. So it's so deeply ingrained in us. And we so much about me, my, me, my rights, my individuality. How do we go beyond this? And what, what kind of systems can we think of when we want to make the break? Mm -hmm. Of course, a far cry to make those uh, political and those legal systems, but even conceptually, if you were to make the break, mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we even start getting there? Mm -hmm. Difficult question. I think this is where the work of the imagination. This is where the work of the imagination is so tremendously important. Have I lost you? No, uh, I'm just going to change my network for a second. I'm going to pause it for just 10 seconds. Just 10 seconds. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, just now rejoining. You had mentioned the word I've read somewhere, uh, atomistic. We are atomistic, we are separate. Even though atoms don't live separately, they live in, <laughs> they live in a whole sort of a body of energy. But somehow so, we, we are separate. So your, your, your question provokes my answer, that, that these are stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. You know, as you say, even the story that we tell about the physical world is a mythological story, uh, which probably reflects a certain type of social and economic organisation that arose, you know, kind of in, around the 17th century in, in Europe, where the rise of the individual was part of a, you know, a greater system of marketization and commodification. And then we start to talk about the natural world that way as well. And then we say, well, because the natural world is that way, we're that way. So you have this circle of affirmation of a certain understanding of the world. So the stories that we tell about ourselves and about the world are tremendously important. And, and I agree with you that all around us, whether it's the way that we eat or the way that we travel or the way that we work, uh, there are systems that are constituting us over and over again as these particular types of beings who are separate and who are not embedded and who are not interdependent. So that, that's why, I, I mean, I think there are two types of answers to that. One is different types of experiences. And, you know, you referred earlier to, uh, to the book that I wrote, Summertime, uh, which I started writing in the midst of the Black Summer fires in Australia, the 2019 and 2020 fires. And there was a piece that I wrote during those fires uh, that was published on a, on a media site. And it was about the grief that one of the pigs that I live with was experiencing. He had survived the fire and his sister had been burnt to death in the fire. That's Jimmy's sister, isn't it? Jimmy's sister, Katie, was yeah. killed. And that... Yeah, I think piece, I've seen both of them. Yeah, you've met them both. Yes. Um, and that piece was the most read piece that I have written in my entire life. Wow. That piece about the grief of this other being 
people recognized uh, they recognized themselves in that other being and they recognized their love and their compassion for that other being. I was so surprised by the response that that had. I never got the response, how can you talk about a pig's grief when people are, are dying or where people are under threat? And what that said to me is that when people are exposed under the right circumstances, when either the form of representation has a poignancy that, um, that captivates them or when they are open because they're feeling loss or grief or fear, there is another way of being that is not that far away from us. And one of my frustrations is that there's a story that we, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Australia, so I consider m myself speaking from the West, the Western Academy. What gets said over and over again is whether it's from, you know, the, the Bible or from Aristotle or from Descartes, there's only one story in the West and that's the story of human exceptionalism mm -hmm. and atomism and commodification and extractivism. And I always say, you know, you referred to, to, to poetry. It's not true. There are counter traditions in the West, whether it's romanticism, whether it's, it's mysticism, whether it's feminism, whether it's materialism. The, the, you know, we have to stop telling ourselves this story that we've only ever had one way of being. Because in fact, there are other resources within all of our own traditions and we are capable of imagining otherwise. This is one of the, I'm not saying it's purely a human capacity. I don't know whether other beings have this capacity, but we are capable of imagining ourselves otherwise. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not Pollyanna sure about this. I mean, I think we're in a very dark place. And I think that our capacities to recognise the sentience or the suffering of other beings has been radically attenuated by the systems within which we live. But at the same time, I think that when we, when we find the forms of representation, whether it's film or or music, or writing, or the encounter with another being, the encounter that people have with plants, or trees, or animals, or the ocean, or the river, there, there is this shimmer of difference. There is a shimmer of being otherwise. And so our work is to amplify those shimmers. Our work is to find is not to, you know, for me, there's too much scolding in the tradition of ethics. There's too much, you know, human beings are bad. You know, human beings are supremacist. Human beings are extractivist. All these things are true, but it's not the only way mm. that human beings are. Yeah. Human beings are otherwise also. Yeah. And, you know, to nurture those capacities, to, to, to allow them like like these these tender these tender stems that have not been nourished by our institutions or by our stories but to nourish them again as an invitation for us to be otherwise i for me that is the work that that i want to do and that that i see as very important so before i just if you before we continue i want to share an image of uh of Katie and uh, well, if you just give me a moment, mm -hmm. uh, I have I had pulled out this image. Can you see it? Is it visible? No, not visible. Are you trying to share the screen? Uh, yeah, now maybe yeah. Oh, now it's coming now. Oh my goodness! Did I ever oh. send you this image? You probably did. But I'll send it to very... you. Again. That's very heartbreaking for me to see yeah. Katie alive. So which um, of these was Katie? Katie was the smaller one. The one at the uh, front, right. you see his face, that's Jimmy and Katie is behind. Yeah. 
they're beautiful and i remember them with you you were you were like they were like human i mean like we call they like human with you you just like you know my family and other animals kind of yeah. thought i always they're thought very, of that they're very emotionally complex beings pigs uh -huh. they're very they have a rich emotional life wow mm -hmm. and this reduction of a reduction of uh uh of one second i go back now this reduction of uh ourselves as these uh, one kind of being the stories we tell we have told ourselves we have con constituted ourselves as only this in these categories instead of uh, and this i love this word stories you know i i love the word the way you use them the way people like ants and sing have used them they sort of expand our imagination of the world they they expand the web and the complexity and the interwovenness of everything and i think uh uh our inability to recognize like the word you just used uh for uh katie uh, and your pigs was that they were complex emotional life i have never heard this term to be referred to pigs mm. that of course i have heard the word intelligent that they have complex emotional lives mm. if we don't recognize it um, within, within ourselves we will never recognize it in other beings because we have to submit ourselves to this complexity and somehow mm -hmm. not submitting ourselves to the complexity makes our lives somehow more sorted in a sense that we can oh i i couldn't agree more separate. i couldn't agree more i mean yeah. the the it, it's a it, it, it's a virtuous circle yeah the more that the more that you recognize in the other the more difference beauty complexity wonder the more wondrous your own life is uh you know for me this is the this is the invitation of multi species relationships that you know when i walk outside now into the forest uh, what i'm what i'm aware of when i'm awake and i'm not always awake but when i'm awake i'm aware of being in the presence of a multitude of subjectivities and perspectives and that that it's not just me and my objects it's not you know this limited uh desiccated puny consciousness which is the consciousness of a single human individual it, it it's a consciousness in 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 the presence of an infinite number of possible conversations and that the invitation that that puts out for for life who wouldn't want to take that invitation sure. who wouldn't want that absolutely so this is the kind of a big shift uh and i sometimes feel we have we have that within us because we we live our lives in complexity mm. and we take decisions in complexity but somehow we don't uh, we don't tell ourselves we do mm. we try and simplify things all the time but uh imagine uh if we submit to complexity then i think there's a community which which appears around us even as we speak mm. even sitting here as a person who's not submitting to com complexity then uh in the next moment saying let me think of the complexity of my life and suddenly my community changes mm. the way my boundaries change my physical boundaries change mm. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh my ideas of uh of fairness and justice also mm -hmm. change from the self mm. to something else there's, there's a mm. whole expanding field mm. of uh of a uh, non resolution in a sense or of a different resolution maybe and in that world uh, uh i think the world appears different mm. to us so uh 
as you're saying that we have it within us because we just need to submit to it. We have it within us to go to these new notions or to these, to rediscover these notions within us or even to activate them consciously because I think we don't have to rediscover them, they're there. Mm. But I also find uh, that in, in cultures which are not uh, totally caught up in the separation extract, extractivism mode, uh, I think the self also becomes extracted from these stories. We also extract the self. Uh, there are there's a rich there are rich uh, language of 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 these these things. So how you're a sociologist, but you're also more than a sociologist. I mean, uh, but uh, uh, you also talk. What is when we talk across across these things? You talked of poetry and art and imagination. That's how you started. Who, what are the new partnerships we should invite into our worlds? How should we enrich, us, enrich ourselves as people who want to lead the change mm. or want to think about what those change could be in that sense mm. of leading the change? What kind of new partnerships, what kind of new thoughts, who, who would our collaborators be mm. in this world? Mm. In the academy, as an artist, as just a human being, who should my new collaborators be? Uh, what should my family be? I mean, I'm, I'm radically promiscuous when it comes to collaboration. Yes. Uh, and, and, and in answering that question, I want to go back to what you were saying about when one opens oneself to these possibilities, there's, you know, this multiplicity that opens. But along with that, there has to be a willingness to give up control, a willingness to be vulnerable, a willingness not to know. And part of what stops us either moving into these multiple relationships across species, you know, amongst human beings, is, is, is the, the fear that we have of giving up control. And one of the... I'm hesitant to say gift because, you know, living, living in the face of climate catastrophe, there is nothing that I wouldn't do to have this be otherwise. But once, once one accepts that it is not otherwise, it is what it is, one of the gifts of that is that whatever investment you have in control really starts to loosen a little bit because we're losing so terribly badly. We, we are, you know, there is no sociologist, there is no philosopher, there is no natural scientist, there is no artist who can say, I've worked out how to do this. You know, I've worked out both how to form the, the, multi-dimensional knowledges we need, you know, the cognitive knowledges, the affective knowledges, the embodied knowledges, and I've worked out what we have to do about this problem. We've all got this terribly, terribly wrong, or we're very far from getting it right. So once you, ex once you accept that at the same time as being present to what's at stake, then I think the answer to your question about who do I collaborate with is I collaborate with anybody who is working on thinking about creating in the face of these problems in a way that is opening up possibilities. Right. And um, how does it impact uh, the, the, the places where new ideas are born, like the academia? Yeah, well, it means that academia, I mean, the, 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 I mean, you mentioned the conference that you came to. I mean, the reason that I invited you to that conference was because of your work as an artist and because of your work in communities. So my assumption is that you're, you're doing, you're thinking, you're acting, you're creating on these other dimensions that I'm not and so the academy 
you know, the, chem- the, the academy, I think, has to become a, a much more generous, capacious space. Uh, you know, personally, other than Summertime, which, you know, I wrote, it, you know, it was such a personal book, everything that I've written in the last two years, I've written with other people. Um, uh-huh. And... And I would not want to have a meeting anymore or a conference anymore that didn't have artists there, that didn't have people from the community there, that didn't have activists there. Um, we, we are all coming at this with different histories, with different perspectives, with different capacities. And, you know, there's a, there's a beautiful... Um, there's a beautiful image in permaculture, which is also in Aboriginal knowledge, that the richest, the richest land or the richest space for growth is where the salt water and the fresh water meets. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and this is also, I mentioned Lynn Margolis before, the, the, um, the evolutionary biologist who said, actually, where, where new life, where variation happens is where beings from different kingdoms, from the animal kingdom and the bacteria kingdom, come together and something new forms. Um, So if we are looking for the new, and I use that word cautiously because, of course, there is so much old wisdom that is, is present in the new, but if we're looking in our own practices for ways of thinking differently, of acting differently, my hunch is that it's going to happen at the interfaces of difference. It's certainly not going to happen when I'm sitting in a room with someone who is trained in the same disciplines as me, who has the same preconceptions. Um, it's going to happen where, where you say something or I see a piece of art. You know, I saw a piece of art a few weeks ago of this, it's just this extraordinary, extraordinary video art of birds And it started to work on me. You know, it started to open something in the way that I was thinking about what I was doing that could have never happened from just going along my own track. Amazing. Um, I think, but it's still, you are the exception, not the rule. I think people like you are the exception within the academy also because you are opening up dimensions which normally are very closed in a very disciplinary method. And I think this moment of what we call the Anthropocene invites us to also look at this, these questions in many, many different ways, because uh, there is no other way to answer them probably, except as you said, in the, uh, in the fertility of difference, mm. in, in the contestations of, of, the, of the boundaries of difference, where the salt water and the fresh water meet, and that's where, for that, that's the most fertile place for new evolutionary modes, in mm-hmm. a sense, for new ideas. And these clashes have to be, or these differences have to be welcomed, mm-hmm. uh, I think. But you also live uh, uh, in a country which has such a rich indigenous culture. In fact, uh, whenever I go to a conference in Australia, you first uh, recognize whose land it was. And it's very unusual. I have not seen it ever, ever in India that we do this. So it's a very uh, uh, great awareness and this, uh, this sensitivity to, to uh, other forms, uh, other, other claims than just our claim to something on the face mm-hmm. of it. So my question, <laughs> yeah, at least I- as a visitor, Mm. And so my question to you as somebody who, who inhabits that space, uh, everything is there around you, in a sense. In, in, in the Museum of Modern Art in, uh, in uh, Sydney, I always see a mixture of uh, various origins of artists, you know, both from the white contemporary to uh, mm. the white indigenous, and they occupy the same space. I remember coming to Australia about 20 years back when there was the first major museum uh, uh, art uh, show of which which brought in uh, indigenous art artists into contemporary space as mm. as a way of rethinking what what the identity was and I think these are very important questions which reflect on our opening up and thinking hence then of multi species 
mm. because the multi species world has been inhabited a lot differently in other cultures than the western culture which we all inhabit the western ideas we all have come to inhabit in different variations of them in a mm. sense so do you see i mean what do you see happening in your environment well you know i think in some there in some spheres there is recognition of uh indigenous knowledges and indigenous cultures particularly in the sphere of the arts in the in what the sphere that we call knowledge as if one could separate the arts and knowledge out but you know the knowledge industry yeah. um i still think that it's pretty tokenistic so there's there's a nod in the direction of indigenous knowledges but you know kids don't learn indigenous languages in schools you can't go to my university and do a course on indigenous philosophy um so i think that hierarchy that we were speaking about right at the beginning of our conversation uh where these levels of civilization they still organize uh the knowledge industry largely um and that you know my mention before about the new and being cautious of the language of the new as you say you know multi species justice is a new in inverted commas ideas idea in the western academy but um as far as i know and it's not my expertise it's something that i'm just trying to expose myself to uh different indigenous cultures whether they're in australia or um amongst maori in in aotearoa or in turtle island in north america you know in your own country there are complex knowledges protocols laws practices um which which understand uh kinship relations across the human and the more than human and and beyond what we w- would call life as well you know not just animals and trees but also rivers and mountains and so on um so for me uh and and this is something that i learned from my indigenous colleagues particularly um my colleague christine winter who you know who are reminding me actually you know this is new to you guys but we have you know millennial old practices of how to live amongst with in communion with others um so from my perspective one of the best things that could happen in the sphere of multi species justice is to is to learn about those other protocols about those other ways of organizing the world um because this is as as you know we've been weaving throughout this conversation the the logic that has structured dominant life the dominant logic that has structured life in the west for the last you know 300 year odd years has been one of uh, a radical break between humans and being beings other than humans and so you know going back to your question about how do we break that up one of the ways we break that up is by opening ourselves to other knowledge systems and other ways of organizing the world and they are there i mean we just have to look and accept these are already there it's it's got talking of new uh, new formulations yes new contemporary formulations of them that's right i'm working out what do they look like in yeah. this world you know we 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 are in a very different world now we're in a world in crisis we're yeah. in a world under stress um so it's not just a matter of you know kind of pulling them out of out of you know indigenous practices and then applying them we have to think carefully about what they mean now together we have to think right. together and i've seen you uh living uh in your multi species world personally with your donkey donkeys or at, at least one donkey and ponies yep. and pigs and who knows what else they have uh, amongst them Yeah and I, I've seen you with them I've seen you uh inhabit the same space with them so you are also uh, uh you also practicing you also putting uh into into motion 
things you are researching and thinking about? I would flip that around. Uh, I mean, it's the living that teaches me. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to sound trite or romanticizing, but they're my teachers. You know, I, if I want to, you so I think aptly identified at the beginning that, the structures within which we live constitute how we experience ourselves as human beings. And so I understood very well because I'm a structural thinker that if I was going to be made into a different human being, I needed to live a different life. Um, and I needed to have the earth work on me. I needed to, to have the forest work on me. I needed to have the animals call me into being another type of human being because if I think that I can do that myself, it's more of the same. It's more of the same fantasy of the self-making man with a capital M um, as opposed to this more humble recognition that we are made together and that, that, they also have the power to make us otherwise. Uh, and, and this is not theoretical for me. This is very, a very embodied truth. I, I have become a radically different being by virtue wow. of, of being able to live with them. Mm. Um, and this is one of the reasons that, that I'm so convinced that emotions are an incredibly impo important part of this. This is not some dry abstract process. You know, I, I, these are beings who I love. I love the moss. I love the trees. You know, if I... I remember the moss. <laughs> yes. You know, if, if I'm taken away from them, then yeah. I feel, I feel wow. desiccated. I don't feel like I'm my whole self there. You know, I don't want to call them my family because that puts it into a, a structure that doesn't do justice to it. Um, but we, you know, we become together. I, I probably am the greatest beneficiary more than they are. But, yeah, yeah so I don't think it's about mm -hmm. practising a theory. I think it's about the practice constituting what theory I might be able to articulate. I mean, you, 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 you use the word... Uh they teach me and that flips the equation uh, completely. Uh, so I wonder if you want to briefly share something about that life. You said you've learned, they taught anything you want to share, which people would sort of, uh, and I would uh, think about, uh, which changes you, which informs you so deeply as a human being. Mm. So when, when Jimmy came home from where they had been, so Jimmy and Kate were evacuated when we thought that our place was under threat. And two days later, the place that they were evacuated was immolated by an absolutely catastrophic fire. Wow. We couldn't get there for a week because all the roads were closed. And when we got there, even a week after the fire had gone through, the ground was still hot from the fire. And when we brought Jimmy home, uh, he was, at first he seemed fine. He, you know, he went into his mud bath and he had something to eat and something to drink. And then the next day he started uh, looking for Kate and in quite a, a desperate way. And well, I think he was looking for Kate. That's what it seemed to me that he was looking for Kate. And then a few hours later, he lay down and he, he stopped eating and he stopped drinking. Yeah. And he was in a very deep state of trauma and grief. And we did, everything that we knew to do and that people advised us to do. And we had this just extraordinary response of people offering advice of, you know, how to help him. Um, but there was not that much that we could do because he's an autonomous being. And he, 
he would take himself to this particular place to lie for hours and hours. And one day, maybe about 10 days into this, where we really didn't know whether he was going to survive or not, I went and sat down where he took himself and would lie for hours. And you have to imagine that he, he had lived through a, a sensory trauma that is very difficult for us to imagine. The fire was at 7.30 in the morning. So the sky was black. The sound of a, of a fire of that uh, intensity, it's like planes roaring right next to you. The smell is, is, you know, it's completely, it would have filled your entire senses. He would have tasted it in his mouth. So every sense was overloaded by this world gone wrong. And I went and sat where he was sitting and there was a, a very soft breeze that I could hear through the trees and I could hear the river and I could hear the birds and this, the leaves smelt sweet and the light was soft because it was mottled through the trees and the earth was cool and I realised he had taken himself to this place where the earth was good again, where he, he saw and he smelt and he tasted and he heard and he felt an earth returned to the earth that moves through the cycles that are the cycles that allow us to feel safe on the earth. And so here had I, you know, we were running around and vitamin C and charcoal and homeopathy and antibiotics and feed him this and get him to drink that. And this being had taken himself to a good earth from the bad earth. And I just thought that was the most extraordinary wisdom. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, here are we, we write books on psychiatry and post-traumatic stress. And, and this is what he did to heal himself. That was a huge lesson for me. Wow. Uh, do you know you, you speak like a poet? Hmm. It's very beautiful how you described it. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a lot to think about. Also, the way you recognize, the way you see what is happening. And uh, maybe it leads me to think that we have to trust our instincts a little more how we heal ourselves. Because that's what we do. We go to this, that, and the other. But we don't go to ourselves. Mm. Then we have to heal ourselves. We have left no space for the internalization of self-reflection, in a sense. Mm. Mm. And what you're saying is that it shows to me you're a highly self-reflective person to be able to recognize what another being is doing. You have to, to recognize that, that, that act as something else. Uh, it's a pretty it's, impressive character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, uh, we don't recognize this when we see it. So it is also... Communication, it's, it's the way we listen to the world, mm. which is not ours, mm. uh, but we are part of. We have to also get the ability to listen and mm. to sense it, mm. which we have, but we sort of suppressed it. I think well, we, indigenous yeah. people had it. Had yeah, it. yeah. and children, children have it, poets have it. You know, I think it's less about in acquiring capacities as untangling ourselves from the ideologies that yes. that impede us being present uh you know the ideology of pigs are this you know the number of people who say to me pigs are this or donkeys are this or horses are this and i'm like 
on the basis you know? of what would you possibly say that? How do you know? And yet we hold on to these knowledges with with a surety, you know, becoming of someone who has spent a lifetime studying something when, you know, what if we we heard it in a nursery rhyme, we we saw it in an on a television advertisement. Um so so untangling ourselves from um, superficial but but deeply informing ideologies, I think, would would be uh, would help would you know get us a long way. That's an excellent note to end on. Unless you want to ask me something, which I haven't given you the chance to. <laughs> but oh, wow, so much, <laughs> so much. Um, you know, I I I'm, I mean, I'm interested in in your reflecting on on the power of or the capacity of, of your artistic practice to, to intervene in these uh, constituted ways of being human. How do you see that playing out? What think, have you learnt? I think uh, I inhabit the worlds of this objective science and research in my environmental work, but as an artist, I become more me, where I assimilate and I take everything in and experience it. And then it's an affective way of form making. So the forms which I make have an affectation, has an aff affective knowledge linked to them in a sense, or they are formed by that affective knowledge because they are filtered through the self, mm -hmm. through the cultural self, through the political self, all the selves which I have, they filter through my cells and they come out as something which is deeply, uh, uh, well, in a way complex, but simple, because that is what I want to say in a sense. Mm -hmm. And my effort is always to be able to come to that form, which is honest to what I want to say about it, mm -hmm. in a sense. And that's a complex, uh, and I, I, nothing but the artistic mode allows me that, that mm -hmm. to do this, because everything else requires me to produce something in a certain language or a certain kind of uh, syntax. But here, there is no syntax except what I, 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 I it comes from me in a sense. So as much an appearance, uh, the artistic work becomes as much of an appearance as a deliberate act, because mm -hmm. when you're confronted with your own, uh, what you create, then you also, are an outsider to what you create and you, it feeds back into, for, into forming thoughts to understand what, what is it you are feeling about something. So it's a two-way process. It's a, it's a communication, uh, it's a communicative two-way process between uh, you, uh, you're creating the artwork, but the artwork creating you in return. I understand. And, and there's this thing about when you finish the work, it leaves you and you have to let it leave you because then uh, you move on from it, otherwise you can't mm. move on from it. Oh, and I've been deeply also involved in the questions of selfhood because how we, uh, how we are in the world is the world we create. So what, how I am in the world is the world I see and create and surround myself with. So the deep reflection of my inner, inner being is the world I create around me. So uh, I, I think it all starts from there, from, from the idea of who we think we are and this idea of stories. And this, this is very, very generative for me. It's very productive. And of course, I never thought of the, in terms that of late of the literature I've been reading, the new writings, this idea of stories is, it's a very generative idea because mm -hmm. it, uh, I started doing this work in my grandmother's old house in Rajasthan, where, where it is. It's a dilapidated house coming down, but a big one. And I went to my mother's room and I found all these objects. And I started these relationships with these objects of my dress when I was, my, my shirt when I was two years old and these things. And so it was basically, it's an ab abandoned house, but it's got locked rooms full of sort of artifacts which mean nothing to nobody, but except to the people who have some association with them. But the stories which emerge from them mm -hmm. is almost like the stories of the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. if, if the stories of today, 
because that's how we came to be something else mm. from those places and when we came to be something else the world we created was something else mm. disassociated associated unconnected mm. uh, and i think this disconnection is the starting point of violence because mm. how can be you be violent with something you relate to somebody you relate to mm. you cannot even even animals are not violent are are are, are not violent to things they get attached to or people or other animals they get attached to mm -hmm. we have stories of all kinds of predators mm -hmm. having uh, having associations with all other kinds of animals which are they could be eating them instead so mm -hmm. this how we are is also defines how we become violent in a sense mm -hmm. and i think uh, it's a very big uh, question for me today especially when i think of artificial intelligence and all those things that you know when we create artificial intelligence what intelligence are we creating because we are programming that mm -hmm. so what are we programming in that artificial intelligence being because i'm not sure that we are able to even recognize who we are in a sense mm -hmm. who we can be mm -hmm. and i really think of the future of the of hum humanity as something which is in which is one in a sense this this unique ability to assimilate and be the the emotional quotient person that i can be intelligent or the, is to be wise and be in a sense mm -hmm. i don't think we have we have come to the end of our evolution i think we have a long way to go we have come to a physical evolution but our mental evolution has a long way to go as yet maybe we will evolve maybe multi species justice is another hint at what that evolution could be in the future what kind of beings are we going to be going to be what kind of powers can we have in those mm -hmm. beings where we are able to uh, connect and assimilate and as a natural act not as a, as a, as thinking about it that this is just who we are in a sense it's like the bacteria who live with us in a sense that seems so important to me that that how do we how do we create the conditions under which kindness justice generosity care are just business as usual yes, they're not yes. the application of a principle no. but they're what emerge from our encounter with what appears before us yeah that's really that has to be the ideal because as long as as long as it's an intervention it's always going to fall short yeah as long as i have to you know stop and reflect and say well what should i do in this circumstance as opposed to you know what you said when when that which you encounter when who you encounter occurs to you as part of you as as who you love of of who you want to flourish there's no effort required yeah. in in showing care now i you know of course that doesn't mean we're going to live in a world without conflict there's always going to be conflict because there's yes. going to be difference but I, I i couldn't agree with you more in saying that it's about creating different conditions under which we become who we are yeah rather yeah. than staying who we are and then you know trying to intervene in that so thank you so much daniel uh, it's thank really you. such a pleasure to speak with you